Hello, Ozscope, and thank you for the chance to share with you an introduction to some new infrastructure in Australia to monitor the critical zone. I must apologise to you for the bad puns and to Olivia for using her song. But the more that I look at this clip, the more I think Liv must have been in training to use a really big soil auger. And that's what we're going to need to get down into the critical zone. The need for critical zone science was born home to me when I first saw the results in this manuscript, which is a global meta-analysis of soil carbon measurements. As you can see on the left hand side, in this global analysis, over 80% of the data points come from the top 30 centimetres of the soil. As the authors pointed out, this is fine in areas where the bedrock is shallow, for example, the graph in the middle here, where those top 30 centimetres do capture most of the carbon store. But when we move to a deeper profile, such as that illustrated on the right, this kind of sampling approach misses most of the carbon. In fact, if we pick any system we like associated with soil, in, in general, our understanding and observations decrease with depth, whether we're thinking about the microbiome, soil nitrogen storage measurements, or even perhaps something as basic as mapped soil depth across the United States, one of the best observed places in the world. This somewhat superficial understanding of the subsurface is a problem. For example, how can we understand the role of soil carbon in the global missing sink if carbon is not measured across multiple depths? An example from California where we can't make our hydrological models work because soil mapping says that the hydrologically active zone is only two meters deep. And this in fact is incorrect where trees can get their roots down 10 meters deep and the partitioning of water between recharge and evaporation goes all wrong. And an agricultural example, for a long time we were missing that fertilizing the US Midwest with nitrogen was not just sending nitrogen into streams, but also causing it to accumulate in the slightly deeper soils where it has formed a recalcitrant pool that will remain for a long time regardless of what we do about fertilization above, with significant implications for the management of eutrophication in the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. These kinds of understandings drove a group of earth scientists in 2001 to argue that we needed to think about the vertical slice extending from the top of the bedrock to the top of the plant canopy as its own integrated system, which they called the critical zone. I like to think of this area as being the place where geology is confronted by climate, with generally interesting outcomes, including the creation of the habitat in which almost all terrestrial life is found. The critical zone also supplies many important functions, things that we might recognise as being analogous to ecosystem services. And these functions mean that understanding the critical zone as an integrated system is really important for making land management choices that manage or optimise the provision of these services to people. Buying into this argument overall, the United States National Science Foundation over a seven year period funded a group of 10 new critical zone observatories with the intention of putting many forms of instrumentation into the one landscape to allow the critical zone to be observed across it. The international community broadly got on board so that by 2017, there were at least 45 recognised observatories in 25 countries and by a growing range of scientific metrics, whether we think about grants, papers published or scholars trained, critical zone science was becoming established and being a thing. However, as we can see, it was a thing that hadn't really extended into the Southern Hemisphere, let alone Australia. 
We did have a few attempts to establish individual critical zone observatories in Australia, notably in Western Australia and in Queensland, but we hadn't been able to make the idea stick. And so about two years ago now, a group of us got together and said, why don't we leave aside the idea of individual observatories and instead try to think about piloting a network of observatories that would take place across the continent. And with the support of five universities, several scientific institutes in the ARC, we have been able to fund this through ARC's LEAF program. At this point, our proposed our pilot network has five core sites and several satellite sites. Our five core sites, which is where we'll be installing new instrumentation, are at Pingerley in Western Australia, Calperham on the Murray floodplain, Wellington in the Upper Macquarie River Basin, at Moreton Bay in the peri-urban outskirts of Brisbane, and Fletcherview, a rangeland site in the Burdekin Basin. At these sites, we hope to learn how Australia's critical zone provides life-sustaining services to our growing population in the face of a changing climate. And we want to know how we can manage that critical zone so that its functions and the ecosystems that they support retain their integrity in the face of all that demand and change. In short, we've given ourselves a very broad scientific mandate. To understand the critical zone at these sites, we are in general trying to build upon existing infrastructure and several of the sites are already, for example, considered super sites within NCRIS's TURN network. This provides us with existing access to weather stations, eddy covariance instrumentation, power, comms, and in some cases, surface water monitoring. To this, we are mostly adding subsurface observation capabilities. We're putting in groundwater wells for observations and sampling, a VADO zone monitoring system. We are incorporating these locations into the OzPlot network so that we can obtain information about vegetation structure and composition and have it subjected to regular remote sensing flights. And to try to upscale as best we can, we are also installing soil moisture arrays and permanent geophysics installations. In the back end, we'll have a data management team. And of course, what we hope to do is to connect all of this data ultimately to analytical capabilities, modelers, theoreticians, and in general, people who can do something useful with it. In our current team, we have a very broad array of interests represented. These range from folks who are interested in mineral exploration and whether we can find the signature of deep ore bodies in surface vegetation, termite mounds or soils. We have pedologists very keen on understanding the connection between just what trees are doing and how soils and rock are formed in our ancient landscapes. We have ecosystem scientists keen to understand the role of disturbance and how this disturbance propagates from the ecosystem into the critical zone and out to the atmosphere. And as what I personally think is a very intriguing and appealing piece of low hanging fruit, we certainly have a range of hydrologists and biogeochemists keen to start closing the mass balance within the critical zone itself. What I really want to end with is a call to everybody in Ozscope to please consider joining us in this initiative. We have conceptualised our pilot critical zone observatory network as community infrastructure. We want it to be a place where you may be able to take advantage of the existing instrumentation and of hopefully long-term data sets in order to add value to and leverage them as you conceive your own projects in the critical zone. We are a very nice group of people and we would very much like to have more nice people to play with. And so I'm going to end by just encouraging you to join us in getting critical. Thank you very much.